Welcome to How I Got Here, a podcast from the Garage at Northwestern exploring interesting journeys of young professionals working at exciting companies and the role that entrepreneurship played in getting them there. My name is Mike Rapp, and I love dissecting nonlinear and non-traditional career paths and the lessons that we can all take away from those who forge them. In this episode, I'm joined by Connor Egan, who currently works in global product policy and operations at YouTube and has served in a number of different product marketing manager roles at Google since graduation. As a college student, Connor took on 11 internships during his time in school at a variety of companies from startups to incubators to consultancies and tech companies, in addition to working on multiple student startups. Connor's strategy of seeking out diverse experiences instead of maniacally focusing on a singular path stands out in a world of increasing specialization, and I hope gives you something to think about. One quick note, this recording has a few glitches due to an unstable internet connection, but it should hopefully not be too distracting or confusing. That said, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Connor Regan. All right. Well, Connor, thank you so much for being with us here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I thought a good place to start would be if you could kind of take us back in time uh, to when you were just starting college, what you were studying and what you thought you wanted to do after graduation. Uh, yes, a, co- so a couple of years back now. Um, so I, I started at Northwestern studying economics and uh, fairly early on uh, realized that while I was interested in economics uh, and and found a lot of you know value in the study, um, I might have had kind of the wrong intentions in in choosing econ. I received kind of a lot of guidance that said, you know, if you if you want to go into business and you go to a school like Northwestern where there's not a business program, you can only study economics. Like that is the option. Um, and I I kind of believe you know I was fresh out of high school. I had I had no basis on which to you know refute that. So I kind of went with it. Um, and and while I did I did like econ, I started to realize actually there's there's a lot of paths to business. Um, maybe more paths to business than there are to to most other things, you know, you can, you can, and in some ways, actually, I think they'll take weird paths to where they, where they end up, um, sometimes have the most interesting kind of contributions because they, they did kind of the, you know, the, the non, uh, the uncommon get there. So for me, I ended up finding learning and organizational change, um, in the school of education and social policy as a bit less conventional, but interesting, um, approach. Uh, basically, the way I, I describe it is um, kind of like the the bringing together of psychology, sociology, um, a bit of business, and kind of all like mashed into one. Um, and for me, that was super valuable. Got it. And so your intention was always to, even though you switched from econ to learning and organizational change, to still at graduation work in some sort of business or strategy role or something like that? Yep, exactly. I. I thought um, from the beginning that I wanted to be a consultant. And uh, at Northwestern, uh, I think there are many students who, you know, you, you, come in, you come into a place like Northwestern and you have no idea what consulting is, but you hear consulting a lot. Oh, well, I guess I need to be a consultant. And so I was definitely in that group. Um, and certainly like no, no shade on consulting. I actually think someday I might want to still do consulting. Um, but that again, already I can see a theme here of like it's kind of a default. Um, and that, that was it for a while. And then as I started gaining, you know, like what I would call real working experience, taking ships, um, even, even joining student groups where I was kind of learning the art of business by doing it instead of just reading about it or, you know, watching narratives play out in TV or whatever. Um, I realized that there are a ton of things in, in this world of business that you can do. Um, and so over time, that shifted. Um, there were times that I was like dead set on consulting. Like I said, there were times when I was like, okay, I'm going to a startup. Um, I'm going to get in on the ground floor of something. Um, for a while, uh, I played around with creating my own startup. Um, it, many, many a path I, I explored, I suppose. I want to dig into a lot of those paths, but the first one, because it seems the most unique, and I think I haven't seen this anywhere else, but 
if someone were to look at your LinkedIn, the number of internships you had as a college student is very impressive. Can you talk about kind of what your thinking and strategy was to to have so many internships and maybe describe a few of them and if they were all kind of similar or if they were very different? Yeah, absolutely. So there was indeed a, a strategy there. Um, I, I think when I arrived at at Northwestern, like many students do when they arrive at college as a, as a freshman, regardless of where they go, um, this sense of kind of, I used to be a big fish, you know, on my, on my high school campus. And, and now I'm in this pond that looks very different than the pond I was used to. Um, I think that hit me kind of hard. Uh, I think it hits many people, you know, in that, in that way. Um, but for me, I, I kind of had, uh, this, this kind of, introspective time, especially in that, that fall quarter where I, I tried to think about, okay, you know, I'm, I'm struggling in my classes more than I have in the past. You know, I'm used to just like everything being easy. And all of a sudden, like college is actually a challenge. Like I actually study for things now. And, you know, there's, there's so much that I can dig into. And I'm kind of like overwhelmed by all the things I'm saying yes to, you know, before I even like can really do an analysis to determine what I should be saying yes to and what I should be saying no to. And so my freshman year is when I started this like crazy internship. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what you want to call it uh, journey. And I, I just found so much value in going and, and being in real working environments. And, and in some ways, actually, especially, you know, as a, as a freshman interning, I was given bits and pieces of really cool strategic projects. There was also plenty of stuff that was just like intern work. You know, the the stuff you see in movies or TV or whatever. And it's not necessarily glorious, but I was part of real organizations doing real things, creating real products for real, you know, customers. So that's kind of how this started. Um, to the second part of you, you know, like, were they all the same? What were the differences, pros, cons? Um Definitely a wide variation. And in some ways, I think that kind of like affirms the decision to do multiple. You know, a lot of people, you know, doing like a, a crazy number just isn't the right decision because there's there's other priorities for them. And I think that's for many people, that is the right call. But I, I do think that doing a couple gives you an opportunity to compare experiences. Um, and if, you know, you get to the, the end of your time in college and you've only done one, that's not necessarily a problem. But you will probably make extrapolations from that single experience that might not be valid because it's the one that you have. Um, so for me, being able to say like, you know, working at this, I worked at a startup incubator for a quarter and then working at a startup and seeing things from two different sides, that was super interesting to be like, okay, these who are in a much more evaluate, uh, evaluative you know, state looking at startups and investigating them versus like, the really scrappy, like trying to build something, you know, folks inside a startup, totally different vantage points and being able to compare them. That's where I found a lot of the value. I think that's so wise. And it was 11 internships that you had during your time, right? I think um, it it was 11. Yeah, I think having uh, a breadth and diversity of experiences is underutilized these days. Like you said, I think a lot of students pick one path and just dedicate themselves to go down it. Um, But having those, whether it's different types of companies or different stages or different day to day experiences, just to compare and cherry pick of like, I like this about this experience, but I don't like this uh, makes you much better equipped to actually go down a path that is intentional. Yeah, I I think that's so true. I mean, even even to something as um, maybe you project is like management styles or leadership styles you know i i think it can be easy to be like oh well of course i want a manager who's collaborative and i want a manager who really trusts me or whatever but a classroom exercise even if you are in like management classes and you know kind of going back to what i mentioned before like i wasn't in quote unquote business classes and so even even that kind of understanding of what is what are the inner workings of an organization like for for many students, experience real experience best way to actually kind of get a, a gauge on that, um, and you might realize like actually I I want a manager who lays things out clearly for me, 
Um, and maybe, you know, if you, if you don't have a ton of exposure, you see that as micromanagement or something like that. Or, you know, there's not a lot of trust in, in, you know, how they kind of manage their, their, their workforce. I think it's much easier to be able to kind of like walk those very fine lines when you couple different um, experiences yourself. Right. And especially when you're still in school and you have the safety net that you're not dedicated to this job until you find another. Right. Um, you also mentioned uh, a couple times working for student startups and starting your own company. Um, can you describe your experience with, with those things for me? Sure. Yeah. So um, basically, this organization that I joined um, had a portfolio of companies. So my initial experience was in joining uh, a small startup, a student-run startup, um, and learning from other students who were in higher positions of, of leadership. For me, it was a great way to join and be under the wing of students as opposed to real adults, if you want to call them that, um, folks who could really empathize with, you know, the position I was in as a student, balancing many different needs. Um, you know, I, I still, as much as I prioritize real world experience, I, I did indeed take classes. I did indeed graduate, you know, like, all of that had to be balanced as well. Um, so, so that's where I started. The, the company that I joined was called Project Cookie. Um, the name is, uh, it kind of gives you a sense for what we did. We, we basically were a late night um, cookie business. We sold uh, us to students primarily at um, the, the two main libraries um, on campus at Northwestern. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, this was a business that probably could only thrive as a student business. We we were profitable, not not massively so. No one no one was taking vacations on the non-existent salaries that they made. You know, this this wasn't like absolutely primarily a learning experience, but at the same time, it was also a real experience. You know, like real customers who were students who you know were you know uh, cash strapped. We're spending money on our products. And so if our products weren't good, they would stop. You know, that, that's how the real world works. Um, same thing on, on the other side, you know, our kind of the human capital side. If we weren't treating the, the students who made those cookies and sold those cookies and did the inventorying and, and all of that, if we didn't treat them well and, and value them, they also would quit. And so, you know, by the, the pressure of the realness is part, I think, of what drove the learning is me realizing like if I get a tech and you know if this is a late night student run business that means I'm next at 1 a.m you know of we're we're out of Oreos or whatever it is it seems kind of silly you know talking about but if I didn't do I couldn't just say like uh -huh, I'm asleep you know like I have a I have a midterm and if I didn't do something then real customers would be like what the heck like I just placed an order or I've been waiting or so I, I think that for me was was really important. Um, moving on to like you know the the broader part of your question, that was kind of the start when I realized like oh like being part of something that's small um, is giving me the opportunity to have to wear many caps. You know, technically I had a role. If I'm being completely honest, I don't remember what that very first role's title was um, because you know there were four of us running a business, and so that's kind of the part of the startup is like, yeah, you might have a title, but you're probably doing quite a few things more than that title. Um, and, and that was super valuable. And, and that's kind of what sparked my interest in joining, a, you know, a quote unquote real startup. So I did a couple internships, you know, with in, in startups that were doing a bit more than baking and selling cookies. Um, and, and, and I think, but that foundation though, of, you know, there's there's not necessarily a lot of infrastructure here. There's not necessarily a lot of support. So I had to build it myself. That was exciting. Um, and I think that kind of sparked an interest that then I kind of explored over the, the following years. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm curious, um, because obviously you kind of joined this group that had this portfolio of companies, but you also had gotten all these other internships. And so it would seem that you're very good at either interviewing or convincing people that your work is good uh, or finding ways to, to get opportunities or open doors for yourself. What do you think that is about yourself? Like, What was your strategy in, in finding all these opportunities and actually landing them? 
Hmm. That's a that's a, a tough question because I think inherently, like we we assume when it comes to processes like interviewing and applying for jobs that there is a singular path. You know, like I'm going to optimize my resume so that it looks like the resume I think they want to see. And, you know, I think, I think I, like many people over anchored on like, okay, well, I'll just some juniors and seniors and ask them to kind of coach me on what a resume should look like. And that is a good place to start is, you know, find, find folks who will, you know, help give you a sense based on their own experiences of, you know, how, how you should be approaching this. Um, but you know, to your question more directly, I think you do also need to stand out. If we all had the exact same resume and we were all were using, you know, that same group of seniors and just replicating them, uh, that's also not very compelling for most employers. And so, you know, for, for, you know, really being you in a lot of ways, I think it actually is as simple as just like really being you. So, you know, an example, um, I, in the beginning of my time in uh, high school, not college, had gotten involved in this organization called Peace. And Best Buddies is a sister organization of Special Olympics. Um, basically, uh, all kinds of uh, career development, social development, uh, friendship programs for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so, you know, by the time I got to college, I had been doing this for five or so years. And I always talk about Best Buddies when I interview. Because when I talk about it, people can tell that I really enjoy it and like it and that it's real. And if I, you know, especially when I was much lighter on experiences, if I talked about other things, they might be able to read like he's saying these things because they sound good or they sound right. But I made sure to talk about things that like I knew the passion would show, you know, on my face and in my inflection was real. And so I guess my kind of guidance to students would be. Of, of course, you, you, you want to look at kind of models that you can emulate, you know, people that are, are landing in the place that you want to land in. But you need to balance that with also kind of that introspection I mentioned before, looking and figuring out like, what is important to me? And can I double down on certain things that by investing in things I'm already good at, or I'm already, you know, part of and, and really kind of making real commitments to things? I'll be able to talk about those experiences in a way that is very authentic and compelling. Um, and I think that, it, you know, when it comes to interviewing, that's a, maybe the biggest goal is to come across as someone who, you know, really means what they say. You know, a lot of interviewing is trying to suss out how much of what you put in your resume is real. How much of, you know, the impression that I got when I read this single page do I really think is there and authentic? I think that is the best way to show someone like this is this is really me. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think there are two important points there that you emphasize. One is being authentically yourself, but the second is also differentiating yourself by doing the things you enjoy and are interested in, not just what you're quote unquote supposed to do or what, uh, as you mentioned earlier, like the default is. Um, I think that's great advice. I know you also uh, were involved a bit with the garage at Northwestern. Um, I'm curious what some of your takeaways or the highlights uh, of learnings from working kind of with other student entrepreneurs uh, it, over there uh, were for you. Yeah. So um, working with students who were studying different things than I was, was definitely one of the, the standouts. Um, in particular, I, I worked on this startup that at the time was called 89 Robotics, and we were, um, we were building uh, the first uh, indoor drone intended for use. <laughs> Our very first concept was as a pet monitoring drone so that you could, uh, you know, check on, you know, your dog or cat while you were away from home, which, you know, is, is it, it, the, the concept has evolved quite a bit. But, but all that to, to kind of set up is I was working mostly with folks who were hardware engineers or software engineers, um, not kind of more businessy people like myself. You know, I, I, like some of the memories that stand out to me are, you know, kind of applying a little bit of, uh, you know, 
how do we validate the market needs when we think about this like really cool like technical concept you know and i might not have like learned to think as much like an engineer if i weren't working directly with engineers and i think that goes you know in multiple directions if if you as a student are listening to this podcast and you're in engineering it might be good for you to go and find some non-engineers to try and learn from so that was that was a big one for me that that the garage just very easy. Um, the other thing uh, is that we there was a like a, a speaker series or a, a dinner series. The the real value besides the food was getting to hear uh, real entrepreneurs who worked on like totally like random like things. You know, not necessarily were the 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 industries that they were in like the thing that I was like, oh my gosh, like. You work at Google. I have to go hear you because I know I want to work at Google. Something like that. You know, one of the ones that really stands out in my mind. I'm pretty sure um, the woman who spoke was the CEO of a uh, nannying um, company or something like that. I have no nannying. I've never been a nanny. I've never babysat anyone. But for whatever reason, that talk really stands out to me. Um, and I think in some ways, like that's again part of the value. This exposure to business models markets, consumer needs that, you know, maybe you yourself don't know anything about because they aren't your, you know, consumer needs. There's not a market that you yourself is in. Um, and, and being, you know, exposed to so many different ways of thinking, I just kind of bleed over effects. You know, now, like, I, I could never have predicted it at the time, but I ended up in my first job out of college working at Google on a privacy and security team building a, a product for kids and families. And I'm sure, you know, there were some some takeaways that, you know, they weren't super conscious, but I had had these kind of gears turning from some random talk from, you know, the CEO of a, of a nannying company that then like when I'm going out and trying to market to, you know, moms and dads, I'm able to kind of tap into that knowledge. And so I think like the exposure to things that maybe at the moment don't slot perfectly into some master plan. I think there's a lot of value in in that in that kind of learning. I agree, and I think we're we're seeing a strong theme here of exposure to diversity of ideas, experiences, and people is has been a strength in your career. Um, and speaking of, you, you mentioned when you graduated, uh, you landed a role as an associate product manager or APM at Google. Um, can you describe kind of what the recruitment process was like and how you both picked, but also landed that role? Sure. Yeah, so so I actually was an associate product marketing manager. The programs are very <laughs> are are one like even in name very close. Um and actually in kind of how they're set up are are quite close. But essentially it, it's a rotational program designed for uh new grads. And the value <laughs> we really are going to hit on this uh this main theme over and over again is that I got exposure to multiple things and it was built in. Um, and, you know, like the fact that these programs exist and have existed long before, you know, I came to discover them is a testament to the fact that, you know, I'm not some pioneer in like get diverse experience. But anyway, so, it, uh, you know, you, you enter the APMM program and you, you start in a role for 18 months and then you are required to switch into something new. So that was that was of great value for me. Um, they're kind of big piece and, and what drove me to apply to these programs and eventually accept an offer, you know, from, from one of these programs is the focus on um, structured network building. I think, you know, for a lot of students leaving college, it, it sometimes it's, sometimes you're able to predict it. Sometimes I think it kind of, um, you know, surprises people, but there's a lot less structure in the real world than there is in college. You know, when when the quarter ends, there's there's not a, a process for deciding, you know, okay, well, what classes am I going to take next quarter? And, you know, like a lot of those things that you kind of start to take for granted as a student are gone. And so for me, like I valued a lot that I had this kind of, you know, smooth uh, transition into a way less structured, you know, working world and, and rotational program um, helped for, with that for me, you know, for the record, for those listening, these, these are beyond product marketing and product management. I know of rotational programs in 
HR and finance, um, and they're also beyond the tech industry. So, you know, if something like this sounds interesting to you, uh, I think it's worth kind of doing an investigation to, to see if something like that um, exists in the in the industry or company you want to work in. Yeah, I agree. Um, can you just touch maybe briefly on all of the roles that you've had while at Google and um, where you are today and what you're working on? Sure. Uh, so, you know, as I mentioned, I, I started in this. Uh, it, it, so this is actually also kind of an interesting one. So the rotational program was in the marketing organization and my, my role was as a marketer, but in my very first role, I, I, I did a lot more than marketing. Um, and that's something that I've realized actually is, is an, el- an element of many roles of, you know, the, the job title does not reveal, um, even, you know, a fraction of all of the things that the actual job entails. Um, and so in, in that role, I was building a, a program, uh, a product, if you want to call it, for uh, kids and families designed to help uh, keep kids safe on the Internet. Uh, the, the insight that was driving is that, you know, people were kind of uh, feeling disempowered when it came to technical concepts like encryption and phishing. Um, and mal um, because they they felt foreign, and so my goal was to find a way to really bring these technical concepts down to earth a bit, um, make them more accessible, um, and find a way to make them engaging as well. So I love that; it was super interesting. But then, and this is kind of going back to what I mentioned before, then I was forced to leave, you know, because that's part of the program. And I was loving; I was one of those people who was like, oh, like I could actually do this longer like do i have to leave um and while i still love that team and and you know i catch up with members of that team all the time i I am glad that i was forced to go do something uh, different and i this is not going to sound surprising for anyone who's been listening i decided to do something totally different um and again like back to that diversity of experience thing i Moved uh, across the world, halfway across the world ish, uh, to uh, to essentially get a, a global working experience be- uh, because I had not studied abroad as a student. And right when I graduated, I I regretted it. It was like I was like, why why didn't I do this? Um, and so an opportunity presented itself to go and work abroad. Um, I I moved to Amsterdam and joined uh, Google's Northern European uh, retail marketing team. So I was working on hardware products um, from from Google and Nest. So like Chrome and Nest cameras and thermostats and all of that, completely different than privacy and security. Um, and again, like found a ton of value. You know, I had never been, you know, conversations with retailers where, you know, we are trying to actually sell something. You know, when, when I was working in privacy and security, we weren't selling anything. So it was a very different world. And yet my my title was the same. Um, and so, again, going back to what I mentioned before, and I think this is, you know, I, I remember being a college student and looking at LinkedIn and trying to read between the lines and like figure out what do people actually do based on these titles. That can be really hard because I was an APMM in both of these experiences. And one, I was, you know, selling Chromecasts and the other, I was building a game for kids. Um, so anyways, we'll, we'll kind of move on from, from that one. I had a great experience living abroad. In a, in a lot of ways, I think the value was even more so on the personal development from the professional development front. So I love that experience. Um, and then the the last one uh, and and current role that I'm in, uh, again, there's a, there's a bit of a kind of story in the transition. Um, and this one it kind of comes from a more birth place. Uh, I uh, about a year and a half ago, June 2019. There was a hate and harassment um, incident on YouTube. Uh, a queer journalist um, was being repeatedly harassed, um, and in my view, um, YouTube uh, didn't do enough to take a stance against that. And there are, you know, th- there's a lot of com- complexity here. Um, I'm I'm a, a proud Googler. I think Google really does live up to its mission of, you know, trying to free and open platforms that benefit many people. And this was a very hard call. So, you know, not at all dissing my employer here, but I did think in this case, we could have done it better. And so I was like, 
well, I can either, you know, be frustrated or quit or, you know, make a ruckus, or I can just go and join that team and try to fix the things that I think are broken um, and, and really kind of prioritize the, the community that, in my view, was, was not seen as important as it should have been. And th in that case, that's the queer community. Uh, that's, that's what I've done for the last little over a year, working on um, policy and, and kind of operations um, in uh, the kind of monetization world at YouTube. Sorry, that was that was very long winded, but now now you you really have the journey. No, it's great, and I love the stories of why you chose each thing next, uh, the reasoning. But specifically, it must have been energizing to have this like personal mission that you're able to then go and influence your employer with so quickly. Absolutely, I mean, I would encourage, I would encourage everyone to think about, you know is there something about the role that I might be taking or the role I'm applying for that I know I have a personal investment? It doesn't have to be like, I'm queer and I want to do good things for queer people. That, that's a good one. But it can, it can also be like, I really love math. Like I'm a nerd and like, I like math so much that I want to do a role that has a ton of quantitative, you know, work as part of it. But something that is genuine where, you know, it's not just like, this will be great for my resume. This is a good brand or that's a good title, or the pay rate is awesome. You know, there needs to be at least something there that's, that, that is that personal motivation, because even in that, that great role, like there are going to be days where you're like, I hate this, you know, this is not fun. Like, I just want to do something different or be on vacation. And it's the personal investment, I think that, that keeps you invested in, and performing well. I totally agree. That internal motivation of learning or enjoying what you're doing lasts a lot longer than the external of this will look good on my resume. Um, wrapping up here, if you had one piece of advice for a young Connor who was in school and was ambitious and wanted to follow in your footsteps, um, what would that be? I don't think this will apply for everyone, but I think for those that it does apply to, I think you'll kind of know I'm talking to you right away is I think it's important to take yourself too seriously. You know, part of I was a very serious student. You know, I, I, you know, most people don't go around asking people like, what did you think of me back then? Or, you know, that kind of thing. But I think if I asked people, I, I, I do think like I made a lot of trade offs in pursuit of all these internships and all these whatever that made me kind of like, a bit ruthless in my prioritization. In some ways, I'm really thankful for that. Like I've landed in a place where I'm really happy. Like I like my job. I like my life. Like I feel like I have been and will continue to be successful. But also, you know, maybe I didn't have to be so committed to a plan. I think I was really serious. And uh, that doesn't mean I didn't have fun. Like, I miss Northwestern all the time. I loved being a student, like being in college in general. Like it was great, but I don't know, maybe I would have had even more fun if I were a little bit more flexible with my plan. That's not, that's not invaluable. You know, that, that has a lot of like meaning, um, even, even meaning that you can turn into these professional, what, uh, types of achievements too. You know, there's, there's value in that personal stuff, in that stuff that, that doesn't necessarily fit into uh, some sort of formulaic plan. So yeah, yeah, it's all a balancing act. I completely agree. And I think that's a, a good place for us to end. So Connor, thank you again so much for being with us today. Thanks a lot for having me. If there's one lesson I would take away from Connor, it should be obvious. His prioritization of gaining exposure to a diversity of experiences, ideas, and people has not only armed him with the knowledge of what he enjoys and is interested in, but has also opened up many opportunities for him. These diverse experiences have empowered Connor to be flexible in his career and follow the path that is most interesting and exciting to him instead of what he refers to as, quote unquote, the default. I hope Connor's story inspires you to seek out diversity in your experiences and never fear trying something new. How I Got Here is a podcast from The Garage at Northwestern and is produced by Melissa Kaufman, Ben Williams, and Elizabeth Wright. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform.